Um, welcome to today's uh, collecting, Connecting to Collections Care webinar. Um, Connecting to Collections Care is a program of the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation uh, with support from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and technical support uh, from Learning Times. And this program was begun, by, excuse me, by Heritage Preservation and ASLH in 2011. And FAIC has continued it as Connecting to Collections Care beginning in January of this year. Um, we offer free webinars about once a month. The next two coming up uh, next week on May 1st as part of the May Day 2015. We are offering a webinar uh, that's part of a whole national initiative that's sponsored by the FAIC with funding from the Polygon Group. Um, and then in June, we're going to have a preservation metrics uh, webinar with Heritage Health Information and Preservation Statistics Program. And that registration should be on the website by the end of this week. And please uh, check our website, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We like all those things. Um, and that's how you can find out what's going on. And the website is now fully operational, so be sure to check it out. And if you have anything to say about this program, good or bad, any suggestions, any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at this email address. Now, for today's webinar, our presenters are Ernest Conrad, who's a rarity in conservation in that he's an engineer. He has a BS degree in civil engineering and MS in environmental engineering. And he's a professional engineer in mechanical engineering in 12 states. He's the president of Conrad engineers and the past founder of the Landmarks Facilities Group, uh, an engineering firm that specializes in environmental systems for museums, libraries, archives, and historic facilities. And most importantly, he recently co-authored the Ashray Applications Handbook, Chapter 20, Museums, Libraries, and Archives which is part of the national standards in the areas of HVAC and refrigeration. And the first um, national environmental standards for cultural institutions. And our second presenter is Lisa Miebach, who's a conservator who specializes in the treatment of objects, collection surveys, and training. She was accredited uh, by the Canadian Association of Professional Conservators in 1972. She's worked in museums and government agencies of all sizes in Italy, Iraq, Canada, and the United States. And over her long career, she's done over 180 collection surveys, facility planning consultations, exhibit environment planning, mannequin designs for permanent and traveling ex ex exhibits, and, and long-range pl preservation plans for museums of all sizes. So we'll get started. Um, and we'll start with Ernie. I'm going to turn it over to you. Are you ready? Turn on your microphone. OK, I got it. Uh, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, or wherever you're from, in whichever time zone. Um, I'm going to be the first part of the presentations today. And what I'm going to talk about is, if I get this thing to go right, uh, we're going to talk about HVAC stuff, and this is what's what's important is to know all the different things in our environment that affect the collections that we have, and so we're going to talk about each of those things and how these collections have to deal with these different uh, environmental factors. And there's actually only six of these things that we have to memorize, uh, and then after that, we'll talk about a couple simple solutions for you folks. I'm going to start with uh, some some basic information, and I have a, a question for you all. And the question is, how many people know what a BTU is? And Susan's going to put up a poll. So the question is, how many people know what a BTU is? That's not bad. What's interesting is a BTU is a 
British thermal unit. It has nothing to do with the British people. Uh, I'm not sure how it ever got that title. But basically, one BTU is the amount of heat it takes to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. And all my units today are going to be in English units. So you have to convert over the centigrade. Basically, it's a two to one ratio. It's one, Fahrenheit. one centigrade is worth about two Fahrenheit. And the next thing you have to know about is as we go through these different six heat loads, there are two types. There is the type that's called a sensible heat. Sensible heat is the energy that just changes temperature. So things like the heat from a light bulb is dry. So that's, a, that's what's called sensible heat. The other piece of the engineering in here is what's called latent heat. And latent heat is the moisture part of energy. Like, the, like, like people, when you sweat, that moisture is latent. So everything comes in two pieces, either sensible or it's latent. Okay? And all these things, we, we measure them in terms of BTUs. So all these different elements, if we think about it, we have to use BTUs and you know, a watt, one watt of electricity, one watt is equivalent to 3.4 BTUs. And that's a sensible heat load. Okay? Now, when it comes to moisture, all our uh, heat is measured in BTUs again. And the simple thing is to remember is 1,000 BTUs is the amount of energy it takes to take one pound of liquid water and turn it into one pound of vapor. Okay, so it's a thousand BTUs of moisture is that energy taken from to a liquid to a gas state. Okay, so let's put that. Let's see if we can figure all this stuff out. What you what you see here is this happens to be Grand Central Station in wonderful New York City. It's just like any other big old train station on in the planet. And uh, if we look at this image, uh, we can start to see what are the different types of heat loads that affect this building. If you look in the uh, upper right side, there's, there's windows. So we have solar, so solar energy. And if we look, you know, there's some in the background, there's some lights and things like that. But basically, uh, the lights are the other piece, and that's a sensible heat load. Solar is a sensible heat load. OK. And then, of course, we have people all the people walking around. And so the people are both a combination of sensible and latent. The way it works out is when we think of solar energy, if I take one square foot of surface horizontal at high noon on June 21st, that one square foot has about 237 BTUs of heat on that surface. So if you think about your museums that have these skylights, all these wonderful things, we have a thousand square feet of skylights. Take that 1,000 square feet and multiply it by 237. That's the amount of BTUs of heat that's coming through those skylights. Okay, and we talked about lights being uh, converted from watts into BTUs by multiplying 3.4. So if I had a 100 watt light bulb, that light bulb gives off 3,400 BTUs of heat. That's a sensible heat, okay? Then the people part, if I, uh, like myself right now, I'm, I'm calmly sitting, a little bit nervous, but I'm putting out about 250 BTUs of sensible heat, and I'm also giving off about 250 BTUs of latent heat, and that's every hour. So total altogether, I'm, I'm giving off about 500 BTUs per hour of heat from my body, okay? And half of that's sensible, and half of that is latent. Okay, the next piece we have is when we think about the building envelope, we have a thing called transmission. Transmission is the amount of heat that flows through the walls of the building, from outdoors to the indoors, or from the indoors out to the outdoors. Okay? And when we measure transmission, transmission is measured in what's called U value. And it's interesting, uh, when you go to the store, and if you're going to buy some insulation, uh, you should see the manufacturer advertises as an R value. It says it's an R30 insulation, an R15. And in our world, we use the inverse of that. If we take that R and divide it into 1, you'll get U. So U is nothing more than the inverse of R. 
And one of the things that they do in the store, the reason that the manufacturers use R is because the bigger the R number, the more you have to pay. So if they use the U value, it would make no sense that the smaller the number, the more you have to pay. So they use the advertising in the stores of using R. In our engineering world, I use U. So to give you an idea of what some U values are, 10 inches of concrete. Uh, concrete actually resists the flow of heat pretty well. So it has a U value of 0.61. Uh, three quarters inch of wood is a U value of 0.58. Eight inches of brick, 0.48. Uh, 12 inches of stone, so it's about 0.55. Eight inch concrete block is about 0.52. Single glass is about terrible, 1.13 glass. Single glass is one of the worst uh, U values that you can work with because it, it lets heat pass through it very easily. So it has no resistance to, to speak of. And double glass is a little bit better. It has a U value of 0.55. And if you look at triple glass, it has a U value of about 0.36. Okay, so now we've got those all figured out. And if we think about it, uh, if you buy actual real insulation like uh, one inch of rigid foam board, it has a U value of about 0.2. So when you see that one inch of insulation board in the store, it has an R of 5 stamped on it. Well, R of 5 inverse is 0.2. So it's one and the same. But you see all materials do have some course, some form of insulation capability. It'll slow down the transfer of heat. Some are much better than others, and glass is about the worst of them all. Okay. Now, the chart we have here, uh, it takes those U values, and this chart is what I like to call architect's denial. And what that means is a lot of people uh, who, and the architects don't understand how condensation occurs. And what this chart shows, if we look uh, on the far right-hand side, there's a table, and then the values show outdoor temperature. And those are these parallel lines. And so if I look at an uh, example where it says zero, that's zero degrees Fahrenheit outside. Okay, so that's outdoor temperature. And then on the bottom, we have what's called U values, the materials. In this particular case, we have a dotted line at 0.5, I'll call it 5.5 or thereabouts. Okay, so that's probably insulating glass. So it's a U value of 0.5. And if we follow that dotted line up to where it touches with zero degrees Fahrenheit outdoors, and then make a left-hand turn on the left side, this tells you the relative humidity at which point condensation will occur. And ladies and gentlemen, this thing has never been wrong yet. So if I have uh, insulating glass and it's zero degrees outside, I will not have any condensation on that glass until it gets up to about 40% relative humidity. So if I had 50% relative humidity in space, I will have condensation. And that's how this chart works. It's a great little chart. You can take it to the bank with you. It's always right. But what's interesting, if you take a look at on a, uh, a U value, we said glass is 1.1. So the 1.1, way down there in the bottom right-hand corner, and if it's zero degrees outside, I am going to have condensation on my windows at about 10 or 15 percent RH. It doesn't take very much. So if I want to have a humidified building and all I have is single pane glass, condensation is going to be a major problem. So this chart works very well. You can take a look at different types of U values and materials. And the one thing that uh, I always found out is there's a magic number. And the magic number is 0.4. If I have a U value of my wall material of 0.4 or smaller, I will never have condensation virtually. Because if you look at the 0.4 and four uh, zero degrees outside, that's about 50% RH. So if I have a U value of 0.4 or less, I can always maintain an environment of about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% RH, which everybody loves to have that in the museum, and that works very well. So anything less than 0.4 is uh, a good enough insulator that it's unlikely that you're going to get condensation. So you can take, take things like a, like I have a brick building has no insulation. That was a U value of about, I think about 0.6 or 0.7. And now you can use this to determine at what point you're going to have condensation. Okay, so 
as you all become smarter and smarter and smart enough to be dangerous, the next thing that happens is we have two more elements that we have to worry about. And the next one is infiltration. And infiltration is the air that leaks into a building, comes in one end, and goes back out the other end. All right? And usually when we talk about infiltration, and this infiltration is outside air, so it's both sensible and it's latent because it has moisture in it. And this material, uh, as it moves in and out of building, generally we take a, a modern building, say something built in the 1970s and later, we normally see an infiltration rate of about one air change per hour. And that may not sound like a lot, but if you think about it, every hour, the complete volume inside a building comes in one end and goes out the other. So infiltration is a huge element in our environment that affects our collections dramatically. And it's probably one of the few of these different types of heat loads that we know the least about. But it's there and it's, it's a major number. If you think about every hour, the complete volume of the air in your building changing over. Now some of these new green buildings and uh, high performance buildings we talk about now, uh, they're able to get their infiltration rates down to maybe about a, a half of an air change per hour. But even at a half an air change per hour, that's still an awful lot of outside air, which in the, depending where you are, it's humid or it's very dry, and we're trying to maintain a relative humidity inside the building. That's a big number you have to take on. Okay, now the last one is a thing called outside air. In, in our world of engineering, we use the word ventilation. Ventilation is the same as outside air. Lots of people use the word ventilation as, as if it's just air going around and around and around. But in the engineering world, ventilation is outside air. That's the outside air. It's, it's mandated by code. The building codes say you have to have so much outside air pumped into your building so that you can be nice and comfortable and you're not going to have a buildup of carbon dioxide and odors and things of that nature. So it's fresh air, they call it. It used to be fresh air, now it's just outside air. But it's the air that we have to bring in by code into our buildings for people comfort. So that's the six of them. Now the next thing we should talk about a little bit is these different elements. And the moisture is probably the most important of them all. And the way we measure our moisture is moisture is measured in the air in terms of pounds of water per pound of dry air. So it might not sound like it's all that uncomplicated, but a pound of air. Anybody know how big a pound of dry air is? I'll help you out. One pound of dry air is about 13.5 cubic feet. So if you can think about the room, every 13 and a half cubic feet of the air weighs about one pound. And so we measure relative humidity and we measure it in terms of pounds of water per pound of dry air. Okay, if I were to take as an example, uh, let's take 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% RH. That uh, amount of moisture has about 0 0.0075 pounds of water in every pound of dry air. So you have 13 half cubic feet of air, and you have 50% relative humidity. The total amount of water that's in that air is 0 0.0075 pounds. It is tiny. If I take that same package of air, 13 and a half cubic feet, and I take it from 50% relative humidity and put it up to 100% relative humidity, the amount of water now it's in that one pound of air is 0 0.016. So 0 0.016 pounds of water, that's like a, a half a teaspoonful. That's the amount of water to get 100% relative humidity inside of 13 and a half cubic feet of air. So you can get a feel for how delicate it is. Such a small amount of moisture in the air can cause saturation and it can cause very high relative humidities with very little difficulty. 
And this is why it's so hard and so costly to try and maintain a tight relative humidity in your space. The machinery that has to do that has to be very precise, and it is costly to do that. So you can see that the, this, this tiny, tiny amount of water is enough to cause mold and all those other yucky things. Okay, another thing to know about, too, is organics. So much of our collections are organic materials, or wood and things like that. And these things are called hygroscopic. Now, what we mean by hygroscopic is that wood can absorb water and it can give water off. So, if we take wood and stick it in the oven when nobody's looking, turn it up about 200 degrees, it drives all the moisture out. If I take the wood back out and let it sit in the environment, it will absorb water and it can gain weight. And normally, wood has about 5 to 10 percent by weight of water all the time. So, when we have, we talk about wood is rotting. Wood starts to rot when its moisture content starts to get to be 15 to 25 percent. That's weight by water. So, you think one quarter of the weight of the wood is moisture. And this is moisture in a vapor uh, form. So, what happens is if you think about the sun coming up in the daytime, the sun heats up wood, drives the moisture out. The sun goes down at night, the wood cools off. It now absorbs moisture, okay? So, given that, how many people know Lucy? We have a, we have, there we go. Question is, how many people know Lucy? Okay. Well, we're going we're to tell you a little bit about Lucy. She is what's called an architectural folly. She was built by an architect who was in Margate, New Jersey. He's right down from Atlantic City. And he's trying to sell land for people to come vacation. So he builds this 60-foot high elephant. And that is a howdah on the top. As, uh, people would go up inside this thing, stand up in the, high, in the howdah. They would look out over the land to see a piece of property that they're going to buy. And that's Lucy. And so when we talk about Lucy, she's a perfect example of some things we can do and how the moisture works and how we can protect things. Uh, how many people ever visited Lucy? We have a couple people out there. Four? Five? Okay. Well, she's down there in, in Margate, New Jersey. She is a, uh, there's a organization called APT, Association of Preservation Technology. Lucy was her first cover girl on that journal. So what I'm going to do is I go on to the next picture, and you can see that this is Lucy. She's right there. That's the Atlantic Ocean. She's not but a couple thousand or maybe a thousand yards or less from uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So she lives there, and if you look at her skin, Lucy is, is a wood frame uh, animal, and she has a covering. It's a tin, a turn coated tin covering, which is all soldered together, and then it's taped with uh, a, a rubber mastic tape over each of the joints. So she's almost waterproof. So you could think of her as being so tight that she could probably even float. But that's Lucy's skin. Okay. Now, if we look at Lucy. Uh, if you look real closely, you see the rust. So her, she has water pouring out of her, out of her, her trunk. Uh, her, her, her tongue has been drooling. Uh, she's had to, you can almost bottle the water that comes running outside the insides of Lucy. So we look, this is inside of Lucy. So what you see there is that Lucy is a museum. And in the middle there, you can see all the little uh, memorabilia and things of that nature, which uh, we're trying to protect as of her collections, and there's people in there, and you'll notice inside it's all wrapped with uh, foil-faced insulation, all on the inside. And what you, this used to be a house. A family actually lived in Lucy at one time, and you'll see the framing there. It's all metal framing now. At one time, that was all wood framing, but it's been changed because of rot. And so it used to be used to be walls inside of here, these uh, vertical walls that used to be part of a house. 
So we're looking at Lucy and it's all that insulation. Now if I were to go and take my hand underneath that insulation, this is what we see. I could reach in there and I can pull out a fistful of rotted wood, soaking wet. It's unbelievably wet. And so the question is, what made Lucy rot? I'll help you with that a little bit because what we talk about is all this material inside is wood and wood is hygroscopic. And so we think about the sun activity on Lucy. Lucy's really the world's largest terrarium. If you guys remember kids when you had uh, when you were a child or whatever and, and you had a terrarium. What it is, it's, it's, a, it's a jar with a small hole in it so that moisture can move in and out of that hole and if we think about the activity of the sun, the sun does most of its heat on the earth for about six hours during the day, maybe from like 10 o'clock until maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. And then the rest of the 18 hours of the day, it's, the sun does not put any heat into the building and so things cool. And so we look at Lucy's wood, her wood absorbs moisture during 16 hours of the day and it only releases moisture during eight hours of the day. So it's not, it's not an equal balance. And so what happens is each day when the sun goes up and comes down, we start to have an increase in the amount of moisture within Lucy. And that wood gets more and more and more wet and wet. And finally, it becomes saturated. And not to help anything is to have that insulation on the inside and so what happens is the moisture gets trapped. It's trapped between Lucy's metal skin and the insulation, which is actually on the wrong side. But you don't want it on the other side because it'll look ugly. So what happens is we're getting condensation is occurring inside of Lucy and it runs down in the other belly and it absolutely has rotted Lucy out in less than 15 years of when she was um, most recently uh, renovated that it has gotten a lot. So what's the solution? Let's talk about some simple solutions. A simple solution, if we look inside, the first thing we do is get rid of that insulation. That's the worst thing you could possibly do is have an insulation in the wrong place where it's going to trap moisture. So we take out the insulation and if you look at what's going on here, is the solution is what's called a box in a box. If I take Lucy and inside those walls, I will build a building. I will build a box, a box the size of a house inside of Lucy. And inside that box, I have now people and collections. And I put climate control in that inner box. On the outsides where all the other elements of the, of the animal are, the trunk and the legs and all that stuff, just let it uh, let it just go with Mother Nature. What we want to do is let air simply move in and out and then keep it dry. And so that's a box and a box solution. And you can do this time and time again in your careers, in your historic buildings and things like that, is to use the box and a box. And last but not least is a thing called humidostatic heating. This is a simple technique. And what you see here is a building up in New England. And the, and the top lines are temperature. And the building is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn the heat off. Down the bottom, you see the relative humidity lines. So I'm um, at 60 degrees. I turn the heat off. And over a 24-hour period, you can see the temperature drops down to 40 degrees. And down the bottom, and I, as the temperature drops down to 40, the relative humidity increases from about 10% up to 40%. And that's that 2 to 1 ratio. And you can do this time and time again. As I change the temperature for every 1 degree Fahrenheit, I will change the relative humidity by 2 percentage point. So you can take a thermostat in the wall and switch it out for a humidistat. And you can control the relative humidity simply by changing the temperature. Now the thing is, 40 degrees is not too comfortable, but then I'm trying to protect my collections. But this is called humidostatic heating. I can change the temperature one degree Fahrenheit each time, and I'll gain two percentage points. Okay? And so with that, I am going to stop at this point, and 
I am going to let uh, Lisa take on. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ernie. That's great. Uh, we do have some questions for you, and um, just uh, very quickly here from Elizabeth McGuire from uh, Collingdale, Pennsylvania, was asking, "How do you effectively measure humidity?" Okay, um, that's an excellent question because what we have done. In the past, we've used a thing, a hygrothermograph, okay? And that chart you're looking at right now, that is a chart from a hygrothermograph. What that hygrothermograph is, is basically, it's a human hair, and we all know that the hair of a, of a human is hygroscopic and expands and contracts depending upon the relative humidity. So we take a human hair, and they tie it to a, to a basically to a, a, an arm with an ink pen on it, and there's a rotating drum, and that's what this chart shows right there. And that will measure the change of the in moisture in the air as a human hair uh, expands and contracts. But nowadays, we use electronic devices. We use um, thin film capacitors devices, and we use what's called RTDs, reduce, uh, it's a temperature detector. And these things are electronic sensors that can actually measure the moisture in the air. And they give you a direct readout in relative humidity. And my favorite is a manufacturer called Vaisala, V-A-I-L, Vaisala, S-A-L-A, Vaisala. And they have a great little handheld instrument. It's very fast response. It's very accurate. And you can find them in the website. Okay? That's great. Thank you very much. We also have a question from uh, Connie Manning from Fort Smith, uh, Arkansas. Um, the question is, you've mentioned the 70-50 rule several times now. However, IPI has done research showing this rule isn't sustainable nor necessary. Is this new research incorporated into the latest ASHREE book? And I'll, this is a little lengthy, so I'll, I'll copy it and repaste it in the chat, and you can also see it uh, in the parking lot there. Really. Right, okay. Uh, another good question. Uh, it's interesting, that's an ASHRAE handbook. In fact, uh, I was the co-author of the chapter that talks about the 70-50, and, and I should correct myself, it's not a rule. It was a rule. It's no longer a rule. Uh, it's, a, it's becoming a, a moving target, and I think the Smithsonian is probably on the leading edge along with IPI, who have taken a bold stand and said, you guys are killing yourselves, you're trying too hard. And if you remember when I said that uh, 50 per, uh, a room with 50% relative humidity, the amount of moisture is only 0 0.0075 pounds in a whole 13 cubic feet of air. It is virtually impossible to try and maintain that kind of perfection. And, uh, and the thing is, and your, your collections know that. Uh, different collections have different sensitivities, but by far the most recent research they're showing a much larger variation as being acceptable. But so I just use the 7050 as an example, not as a rule. I hope that answers your question. Okay. So if there are no more questions for Ernie, we'll uh, turn this over to Lisa now. So while we're, while we're doing that, there it is. There okay, it is. Lisa, okay. you're on. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to see a lot of old friends and the attendees. That's really terrific. So from faraway places and strange-sounding names, glad to see you're here. Um, I want to thank Susan for inviting me to join you and Mike for handling these technical issues so we can actually relax and chat. Uh, it's not a very big chat uh, window, but we can make do. Uh, these are the uh, lessons that I learned from doing 
a lot of surveys in museums and in so many places we found that people just don't have the money to follow the recommendations that they may have gotten in surveys or heard about from other people. So what I'll be showing you is talking about threats to your collections from light, rapid changes in humidity and temperature, tests, damage from untrained handling, and loss from poor security. Uh, I'll run through some of these slides that illustrate the most common causes of damage to collections, and believe me, they were not staged. This was real life. Um, and then we'll have a discussion place where you can ask some specific questions. Uh, I will cover the major threats to collections and what you can do about it, but as you'll see on the lower left side of your screen, I've uh, up, uh, uploaded some documents for you. Uh, one is a paper called What to Do When You Can't Afford to Do Anything that the ASLH asked me to do, and uh, a list of suppliers in the U.S. who can provide the materials that I mention in that paper. So, starting, our major threats, as you know, are light, rapid changes in temperature and relative humidity, pests, untrained handling, and theft. And all of you who work in the field know that there are lots of others as well. Light is perhaps our biggest problem. And I realize that compared to relative humidity changes, that doesn't seem like it might be. But one of the big issues is that we don't pay a lot of attention to light as a cause of damage because we're familiar with it. But light is energy, and energy can break the molecular bonds of organic materials, causing fading and weakness on textiles, leather, wood products, and some paints. There are a lot of articles available on this if you're interested in learning about visible and UV lights and the kinds of filters you can put on windows and lighting fixtures that will help you to reduce or control light levels. On a practical note, most visitors can see quite well at low levels, providing that they've been led gradually from bright outside areas and windows to lower light levels, and that even wall washer illumination is used rather than bright spots and dark shadows. It is important to remember that older visitors have more difficulty seeing displays in low lighting. Some museums have buttons to push to provide brief periods of higher light levels. The Lux or foot candle light meter is a very useful tool for museums as it's really difficult to evaluate light levels by eye. Inexpensive models can be obtained from Edmund Scientific Company. Uh, I used to use the Lutron LX101 Lux meter and liked it a lot. That's the Lutron LX101 light meter. And then we have the problem of the lack of building maintenance. That gets us inside and out, if we could put it that way. This uh, drain pipe that you see that is, uh, seems to be standing up based on a, an anti-gravity field more than anything else, uh, comes down to the ground, and on the left you'll see where it exits, into a drain, except the drain's been run over by um, mowing machines. And so it's not actually a drain at all. It's just a heap of rubble. I listed up here, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow. These are the three um, most common machines that are used for measuring temperature and humidity. One of our biggest problems is rapid changes in extremes in temperature and RH and we all have seen the damage that they cause. Too little, and things crack. Too much, and we get mold, and the mold stains. But if you're careful about how you package things for storage, and you have good engineering controls, you can pretty well prevent this damage. Pests. They're tiny. You don't see them. In the lunchroom, where everybody gathers and shares their, their homemade coffee cake, uh, those little crumbs fall off the table and they go into the corners and provide a wonderful uh, smorgasbord 
for bugs of all kinds. Dust is another uh, uh, hazard because it makes a nice cozy place for bugs to breed. Dust and plant soil harbor mites. You usually don't see these on potted plants, but they're there. And they then in turn serve as food for other insects that will attack collections. Dust can also be really abrasive for decorated surfaces, and if it's left in place and people run their hands over, uh, you, can, you can often find that the surface is abraded by the dust. So it's really important that staff are trained in cleanliness in food areas, coffee rooms, and storage areas. And if your museum has receptions or parties, as more and more do, um, it's really important to clean up carefully right after, not just the standard cleaning crew uh, on contract, but the conservator needs to go around, follow them, and, and make sure that they do a really thorough job. So basically, pest control is really staff training. Handling. I know you've all seen many cases of poor handling, or sometimes docents will pick up artifacts and sling them under their arms and then go through a closed door to get to the gallery and talk to the little kitties. And along the way, I've seen artifacts drop by the way and lose bits and pieces they used to come to me to be fixed. So I found boxes that I could give to the docents to carry these things in. In this case, we see that the paintings are leaning up against each other, scratching each other, and we also see that fragile books are being pulled apart by people sticking their finger in, grabbing them, and pulling them out with one finger. I'm sure that all of you are teaching your, your docents and your volunteers how to handle things properly. Storage materials are a big favorite of mine, and I know of many of you, uh, because we found that so many of the materials that we thought were good storage materials weren't. Uh, this, the coin on the right was stored in a standard slide storage page made of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and in a moist environment, that chloride actually forms hydrochloric acid. In this case, it's corroded the coin and destroyed its numismatic value. We do have now a lot of information on which materials are safe to use with collections. And I recommend to you the Spinach Handbook, which is a wonderful source for both materials and methods for storage. The uh, article Good But Cheap that I've appended also has a list of supplies and suppliers. Collections, management. We used to just have a book where people would write down new, new collections coming into the, uh, into the museum. But nowadays, we really need something that is much more um, specific. And it's usually computerized. There are a lot of databases for museums. Some of them are good, and some of them are really labor intensive and not as, as flexible as you would like. Uh, a good database will contain a space for how long an artifact is on display and where it's traveled so that you can suggest to a curator when it's time for it to have a rest and suggest to them alternative artifacts that they might use instead. These databases are kind of nifty because you can link them up to gallery kiosks so visitors can click on, on a, a picture and get more information about an object or professional researchers may use them. And of course, they can serve as a database for a museum website. But look very carefully before you commit to a database and be sure that it has room for the fields that you want to add to handle the issues in your museum. Inventory control is essential, too. We've always had problems with those little numbers written on nail polish in India ink. I'm quite fond of those. but. There aren't very many of us anymore who can write those beautiful little numbers that people used to be able to do. Fortunately, we have special barcodes and RFID tags. The RFID tags are really terrific. The art bank in Ottawa 
uses them. Uh, they have one RFID tag on each object and a receiver on each door um, jam. So as they move something from one place to another, the collection inventory is always, always up to date. And that's wonderful. You can also use these RFID tags in galleries for people to um, use like a QR code with their uh, smartphone and get more information. Security. Well, obviously, we still need the physical access control, uh, but the way that your building is designed and the restrictions that are put on access are very important in keeping the wrong people out of the right places. The inventory control should also be used whenever something is changed in exhibits or collections are moved or people in community museums may take something out to show it at home or it may be used in a ceremony or a celebration. So it's very handy to have a way of tracking exactly where your stuff is. <coughs> it's kind of like that old slogan, do you know where your kid is tonight? As I said, numbers on the artifacts are essential since we don't yet have ways of, of attaching invisible uh, identification systems. But the kind that you use will depend on the budget that you have and the people that you have. I've mentioned the RFID tags and alarm systems, but do please consider the stability of adhesives that are used to attach tags or to write numbers on. Um, even on the conservation disk list, I've seen note of people using uh, resins that we would not use under any other circumstances as something to write a number on. And that's really not uh, been discussed very much. Emergency preparedness planning, I can't stress enough. Uh, I think many of you may recognize these particular objects. Uh, they were uh, burned in a fire. The museum was having a new roof put on and the welders let a spark get into the underlay and the museum burned. Fortunately, this was happening in uh, a city where AIC had a meeting. So uh, some of us went ahead of the meeting to see what we could do and organize people to help. And I'm proud to say that we had a large train of people who marched down the street and went in and cleaned everything and packaged it for storage so that it would be safely, uh, could be safely stored until the museum was able to actually get around to thinking about those collections. But you really need to have your emergency preparedness plan. Uh, I've listed a really good one, thanks to Susan's suggestion, the uh, dplan.org, which was, I think, uh, created by NEDCC. But I recommend to every museum that you have the assistance of an experienced emergency preparedness planner to help you work out a real plan where everybody knows what to do. Uh, there was a museum that I worked with in Wisconsin uh, who were very excited about their plan and did a really good job and guess what, their museum burned. However, because they had already made contact with other museums in the area and had done their planning about where they could move collections, they were able to rapidly move their, their most important pieces out of the building and into safe storage uh, and avoid having them deluged or blown to bits by the firemen. So, what can you do when you can't afford to do anything? You don't have an HVAC system. You don't want to look forward to trying to get one because you know you'll never have the money. But we do have humidity buffering materials that can protect objects from rapid changes. I usually use acid-free boxes. And there's a wonderful phrase that Dennis Piotta, whom some of you may know, coined called a box within a box within a box. And this gives you a stable, dust protecting um, home for your artifact. Uh, and it also provides airspace buffers. So if you have a box 
the, an object in a box, in a bigger box, or a closed cabinet, your objects can probably weather some HVAC disasters without too much trouble. You can use materials like washed cotton fabric as shelf covers and also for curtains to keep the dust out, and those are also humidity buffering material. Cotton absorbs up to 11% of its weight, which is not really exciting when you consider that linen will do 14% or more. So, um, well, you can see that on the, on the screen there, so I won't. I'm trying not to read it. <laughs> if you are remodeling your museum or building a new one, it's really, really, really important to think about functional space. You have to have a space design that fits what you need to have happen and not vice versa, not have somebody design you a lovely building where you don't have room to store things, or a lovely building where your 14-foot high paintings won't go through any 11-foot high doors. I've actually seen uh, uh, artifact technicians moving paintings from one floor to another by putting them on, by lowering the elevator down to ground level, climbing onto the top of the elevator and holding the painting while they ride up to the next floor. And fortunately, nobody's ever been squished, but that really seems to be the hard way of moving things. So if you're going to be thinking about a new space or remodeling an old space, think of these. How are you going to control your temperature, humidity, and light? And will it be easy to do pest prevention with housekeeping and cleaning? How are you going to motivate your staff to sweep up or clean up or not bring in their cookie crumbs. You need a good workspace for collections. Often there isn't really enough space to spread things out and look at them carefully and measure them and put them in the catalog. And you do need workshops with heavy duty equipment like table saws, and that means special electrical outlets, for example, uh, and jump back space, it's called, so that if, if your table saw has a mind of its own and starts to chase you, you can jump back and get out of the way. You also will probably need um, workshops of this kind to develop things for exhibits and for outreach. But please find somebody who will be your OSHA specialist and make sure that all of your rules and regulations are followed. Uh, that's a, a liability issue on the one hand, as well as a safety issue. I'd like to put in a small pitch for Manona Rosol uh, from Art and uh, Theater Safety in New York. Uh, Manona is an amazing resource for health and safety and uh, knows about the chemical properties of a lot of the insulating materials and glues that we're commonly finding today. Long-range conservation plan. This will save you a lot of grief in the long run, and many of you have had long-range conservation plans or have done them for other museums in time. If you don't have one, apply for a grant and get somebody experienced to help you. You really need to evaluate your collections before you start doing conservation. You need to know which are the important things, which are the ones that are most threatened, uh, and not just the ones that are the prettiest and will go in a gallery easily. Look at the physical aspects of your museum and see where there are dangers to your collections. Is it that your doors are too small or you don't have a place to put things down temporarily if they're heavy while you're moving from one area to another? Uh, think about improvements that you would need in storage and display and know which are the most significant objects in your collection and which are those that need the most conservation treatment soonest. This means a lot of thinking and it's rather tedious to make a prioritized long-range conservation plan. But there are examples, there are a lot of people who have done them that you can call on, and it will also help you to think, think things through Think of things that you hadn't thought of before, but maybe you should. And stock up with the tools and materials that will help you carry out your plan 
and remember to update it at least once a year. And then keep a list of your projects that you've done. Take photographs. So when it seems like you never get ahead and, and you've never gotten anything done and there's just more that needs to be done than you ever will be able to, you can look back and see what you really have done. So I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So if anybody has questions, I'll be glad to take those. Ah, I see. How much do RFID systems run? I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of competitors now, and if you want to drop me a line, uh, my um, my email address is lm at heritageprez, H-E-R-I-T-A-G-E-P-R-E-S dot net. And uh, I have a colleague that I used to work with who was a, a leader in the RFID field, and I can find that out for you or put you in touch with him so you can actually find out from the horse's mouth. Um, he's also the guy that told me about the wireless alarm systems. And it, it was pretty exciting because we were talking about an exhibit, it was a traveling exhibit that had some extremely valuable paintings hung on the wall, but the museum didn't have a lot of security. And the way that the museum spaces were designed made it really easy to grab something off the wall and run something else to think about. Um, so um, my friend told me about this, this system. If you put an RFID, a specific RFID device on the back of the, of the painting, when it is moved, like jostled, picked up, handled, and moved, it will set off an alarm, which can be either an audible one or one that connects directly to uh, the security people and even to the police department locally. So you get a head start on catching the bad guys. Um, Jen Munch. Uh, yes, I'm glad to hear that NMII is using that. Yes, the art bank in Ottawa is where I saw it first. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there are others who do as well. And it would be really interesting if we could have a seminar perhaps just on this. Um, Rebecca asks, I've heard that food safe materials like aluminum foil or plastic lunch bags can be used. Uh, that's iffy because lunch bags, that is like baggies, sometimes have a coating on them. Uh, I'm not sure what for, but people have mentioned that. So I would recommend that if if you need to do something like seal up plywood that's being used for shelving or uh, in a storage area or in a display area, uh, yeah, you could use aluminum foil and just tape over the, the overlaps so that there's no gap there. And that does a pretty good job of uh, stopping the off-gassing off that would otherwise build up in a heated display case. Let's see. Um, so generally, though, especially with plastics, uh, I would recommend that you look carefully for uh, archival quality ones. Again, the spinach handbook has a lot of good information, and there are also suppliers that I'm sure many of you know who, who carry conservation uh, quality materials. But no, I wouldn't just use a lunch baggie to store my uh, ancient bronzes in. What I would do is wrap them in washed, unbleached muslin as a humidity buffer and a dust protector uh, with perhaps a small photograph attached to the outside of that. What do you recommend for use for dusting objects that won't abrade the dust already on the object? Well, we do want to abrade the dust, but not the object, of course. Uh, that's kind of an interesting question. You can get very nice um, Chinese painting brushes with white bristles on them that are soft, not the hard hog's bristles. And those seem to do a pretty good job if you're watching carefully. But if you're dusting something that could have loose bits, uh, I would recommend that you use a magnifying visor and dust watching very carefully to be sure that you're not 
uh, catching at a, a loose place or a crack with the fibers and then loosening it or pulling it off. When I worked at a museum in Alberta, we had a um, uh, responsibility for furnishing, uh, for, for um, conserving the furnishings for the Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Village, which was staffed by people who were wonderful interpreters but had not been trained in museum handling techniques. And there was a lot of dust that built up there. Uh, good old prairie winds and, and dry land bring you a lot of dust. And I couldn't find anything that was safe that people would use and that would not end up walking into their homes. So uh, I found a place that sold uh, sheepskins and we, we used a wooden dowel and a strip of sheepskin that was washed, mind you, uh, and wrapped that around in a spiral. And I put a little blue puff at the end so everybody would recognize that this was the museum tool and not something for them to take home because they worked so well. So these were very, very useful. Yes, there could be a da a, a, an issue with lanolin rubbing off on the object, but in fact, because the, uh, the, the pelts are so carefully washed before they're turned into a, a rug or a, a sofa cover or whatever, that didn't, we tested that with glass and it didn't turn out to be a problem because you're not scrubbing, you're just dusting and the dust actually is attracted to the wool electrostatically and those worked very well. So, uh, how do you store doors? Oh, wow. <laughs> I haven't had to. In a place that's big enough, I would guess. Um, and you might treat them like paintings make a, a, a rack like a paintings rack. I'm sure you can find photos of those or go visit your local museum and ask to see their paintings rack and store them standing on their bottoms because doors are constructed quite wonderfully uh, from a mechanical point of view. But if you lean them on their sides or uh, not directly straight up, which is how they're designed to stand, over time they probably will warp. So, um, let me go back up here. I've, I've lost this. Oh, wait. There we go. Doors. Okay. Here's Alana says, we have a large painting collection and only shelving storage for now. Can you recommend a cheap solution to keep the paintings from getting damaged, which is already happening? I'm trying to box as many as possible, but some have very large windows. Good luck, Alana. Uh, I think the the usual painting store uh, painting um, storage is a a kind of a, a what do you call that linked fencing uh, or some other uh, metal grid that you can put hooks into and hang the paintings on. Uh, I think that's about the best that I can suggest is to find a vertical board that you can hang them from where they will not be leaning against each other and scratching each other. Uh, if you wanted to, to send me a picture or uh, an email to, to show me a little bit better, I'll be glad to discuss that with you. Karen says, we need guidance in what to look for in storage containers at places like Walmart. Can't afford to order from archival sources. No budget at all. Oh, Karen, <laughs> I sympathize. Um, I don't know. It depends what you're putting in there, you know. If, if what you have is uh, wood or, um, hmm, if you have sensitive materials, let's say that you have uh, old coins, I'm not sure I would use a Walmart container because we really don't know what kinds of coatings may be involved or how their polyethylene is made. Um, if you feel that that's in, in really important and it's the only thing you can do, I would line the container, I suppose we're talking about a kind of Tupperware container here, I would line the container with aluminum foil and then with washed textile like old sheets. 
I used to go to, um, when I was working in a large museum, we used to buy rolls of unbleached muslin, which is a marvelous material to have for just about everything, from making mannequins to wrapping things to keep in storage. So we would wash this and then, um, um, sorry, lost my train of thought here. So you have, you have the aluminum foil, which would keep the plastic from outgassing into your objects. And then you would line that with unbleached muslin or another washed fabric to absorb temperature and humidity changes so you don't get condensation in there. That's about the best I can say at the moment. But um, again, I'll be glad to discuss that with you. So, washed linen over acid-free cardboard. Um, let me explain that a little bit. One of the problems that we had in one of the museums was that the um, exhibit people liked to put objects at various heights in the vitrines on painted plywood boxes. They would paint, it was convenient for them, easy to make. They had their, their wood shop there, and they could paint whatever color they wanted to go with the exhibit. But both the wood that was outgassing acidic vapors and the paint, which was of unknown quality, were something that we really didn't want in a closed case, particularly because the exhibit lights, which come from outside the case into the case, create a lot of heat, and that changes the relative humidity. So um, what I eventually did was I made a, a variety of boxes in shapes and sizes that the exhibit people liked of acid-free mat board, the thick stuff, pretty easy to work with, and you can use double-sided tape to stick the bits together. I Once it's stuck between the, the, the cardboard, I don't think it outgasses significantly. And then, uh, because linen, which is really your best friend, there's a reason that people wear linen in hot, damp climates. Linen will absorb, as I recall, something like uh, up to 15% of its weight in water. So it's really good at absorbing excessive relative humidity. Cotton, on the other hand, will only do about 11%. So it's better than nothing. But the linen looks very nice, and it's very effective. So objects that are resting on a linen-covered, acid-free mat board box uh, will have uh, more protection from changes in relative humidity than things that are sitting on a painted wood block. The best place to find that kind of linen is Test Fabrics, Inc. Um, because they manufacture their fabrics for scientific testing purposes. So you can specify that you don't want anything with chlorine or you don't want anything with um, some other contaminant that would be a problem for the artifacts you're working with. It is expensive. But our exhibit designers were tickled pink when they had a choice of, um, of colors that they could choose from. They're very muted colors. They're not dyed. They're the natural colors of the linen. And they were very happy with those and just put them away between shows and brought them out again and used them over and over again. <clears throat> so I do recommend that. It's, it's kind of a nice, simple sort of thing. Using cotton for lining shelves and windows, would undyed, untreated be best? Yes. Uh, that's where um, uh, unbleached muslin comes in. It's not very thick. But you can do layers. And those layers, if you have, for example, five layers of thin unbleached muslin, you're also creating air spaces in between those layers. So you get a lot more absorptive capacity than you would with just one. New cotton materials are often um, treated chemically, uh, sometimes with fireproofing materials. I was asked to look at a uh, a fabric ceiling in a uh, government building that was a reception room. The, uh, the ceiling had originally been blue, and it had turned into a really nasty yellow. And they were very concerned. Uh, they were willing to replace 
that fabric, which was actually rotting and, and kind of, well, it was rotting, is what it was doing. Uh, so we, we did some analysis to find out what had happened, and it was that fire, flame proofing had been applied to the fabric. It turn, that's very acidic. It turns out that there are fabrics that you can buy that have flame proofing, flame retardants built into them, uh, which are not acidic. I can't remember off the top of my head where those are. I could probably find it for you. But um, just as a rule of thumb, any fabric that you buy to use in contact with, with objects should be washed. Uh, I recommend going to a laundry, a professional laundry, and asking them to wash it once with detergent and two times just through a full rinsing cycle so that you get anything out that, that you can, but then it's being rinsed. And they can also iron it for you on their mangles so you don't have to deal with that. Um, let's see what's next. Beetles. Oh, yes. Well, Robin, that's a very good point. Museumpests.net, if everybody would like to write that down, um, is a very good uh, is a very good reference material. Robin says a single beetle could often be a random occurrence and not something to worry about. If it is, your best bet is to isolate or freeze the object to defumigate and keep storage areas extra clean and free from dust and debris. You can also use roach sticky traps to control pests and help identify or figure out how extensive your problem is. Absolutely very good advice. Um, freezing, I had, when I was in private practice in another country, I was sent some things, uh, ethnographic material that had been uh, traveling and on exhibit in uncontrolled spaces and was looking pretty pesty. So uh, I got the biggest chest freezer I could get, and uh, a friend who knew about these things helped me to alter the settings on it so that it would actually go down to minus whatever it was the specification was and stay there. Normal freezers cycle so as not to frost burn uh, the turkey inside, as you probably know. So I did write that up, and I put it in the WAAC newsletter at one point, and I think I still may have a copy of that around, how we, how we jury rig the temperature control. So again, if you'd like to write to me, I'll be glad to find that and, and give it back. It's a very good point that you have, though, is that you really used to need, need to use your sticky pads to find out exactly what it is that you're dealing with. And it will also be interesting for you to see which tracks they make, where are they going, and is there a reason, or where are they coming from? Uh, is there a reason? Is there a hole in the wall? Is there somebody who insists on eating cookies at their desk in the um, registration room? Uh, it's important to, to diagnose why you have a pest problem and what pests you have. Ah. Jess Miller Camp says, can you talk about priorities for beginning care of a somewhat neglected collection with only a pittance for funding and one worker? What should be done first? Inventory, card catalog digitization, environmental monitoring and pest removal? Wow, that's a lot. Good, good question. So, my paper, which you should download, Good But Cheap, What to Do When You Can't Afford to Do Anything, will give you answers to a lot of that. Um, yes, I think inventory, well, no, first, clean it. Clean your spaces. Do your pest monitoring. Find out if your safe your space is safe to keep things in. Uh, secondly, yes, inventory or card cataloging. An inventory is essential. How you keep track of the inventory could be a card catalog, could be a computer database, uh, some of you may be whizzes at using Excel. I only discovered a couple of years ago that there's a special 
format that you can find that turns every column into a um, uh, sortable, sortable column. So you can put your objects in there and put, put different attributes in different columns and then you can sort by wood or sort by stone or whatever. So that will help you to find things more quickly. Uh, environmental monitoring and pest removal, I think we've gone through that pretty much. Um, but yeah, you have to have an inventory and you, by the way, you should keep copies off-site so that if your museum burns, uh, your insurance company will want to know what you've lost. And you will only be able to do that if you know what you have or had and where it is. If you move something in a collection, you should note that. Uh, you don't have to have RFID or, or uh, barcodes to do that. Barcodes are maybe a little simpler. What you do have to do is convince everybody to maintain the discipline of always, always, always logging a move of an object from one place to another. Otherwise, you hear the cries of, but I left this here yesterday and now I can't find it. All right, so now, do you have these are wonderful questions, guys. Do you have a suggestion for dealing with non-active, we hope, mold blooms that are present in a large costume hanging collection? Oh, my. <coughs> um, mold is pretty awful, and it's not easy to get rid of, and it stains. Uh, I would talk to the textile analysis service at the University of Alberta because they know more about this kind of thing than anybody else I know. Um, there probably are also textile conservators who have dealt with this, but I don't know anybody personally who has had to. Uh, I think the usual recommendation is to use a heap of vacuum cleaner uh, with a, a, several layers of screens to vacuum the mold off the textile and, of course, away from you. And of course, you're wearing a good um, professional quality uh, dust mask, not the the kind with the with the filter in the front, not just the little white paper dust masks. So um, talk to uh, talk to somebody from from the University of Alberta um, Textile um, Institute, and I'm sure they will have some ideas for you. Deborah from Toronto has very large trophies and no boxes large enough to store them. What do you suggest? Well, make some. Um, Acid-free mat board is great stuff. It's not very sturdy, but you can make that to hold the piece. You can even cut out a little window and, and glue mylar on it with double-sided tape so that you can see what's in there before you have to open the box and take it out. And then you can put, you can build a larger box around the, um, the smaller acid-free mat board boxes. And Karen says, we store, let's see. Sorry, just lost this. Anybody, re remember my email address, and I'll be really glad if anybody wants to, to write to me about this, because I may be able to find resources for you um, that are not coming to my mind right at the moment. Let's see, trophies. We store lots of fabrics, old Girl Scout uniforms in large Ziploc bags in plastic tote bins, some missing covers. Also, old handbooks, scrapbooks, files of newspaper clippings and photos, all managed by amateurs in a basement. I need mitigation fast and cheap. We share space with the sump pump and sprinkler control. Oh, Karen, you have my sympathies. Um, well, the good news is that plastic dope bins are good protection when the sprinklers go off at 3 o'clock in the morning. So if you're missing covers, go to Walmart and get some more. Um, as far as the handbooks and scrapbooks and newspaper files and photos, I would suggest that you um, look to specialists for that. That's, 
I think there are specific materials that you should and should not use, and there may be kind of homemade ways that you can do it. Let's see, the um, Image Permanence Institute might have some information, and I think um, there may be others at uh, Library of Congress, for example, uh, who could show you how they store theirs. Fast and cheap is hard. Um, do, you have, do you have a way of moving those things out of the room with the sump pump and sprinkler control? Uh, water is a terrible thing. I can say that because my basement just flooded. And so I have lived through sump pumps and dehumidification and new subfloors and things like that. Um, I did learn that there is a kind of 2x4 that is waterproof that you can get at hardware stores. It's more expensive, but it means that you can lay that on your um, ground floor and then use that to put other things you know, like plywood on top so that you have a space that you can send air through underneath if you have water in there. Um, Sorry, I can't really help you a lot, but try Library of Congress. I think they would be the best bet for the storage issue. And where can you move them? Um, if worst comes to worst, find the best storage company you can in your town. We have a new one called Dyson here uh, that that has very sexy... Uh, very clean storage areas and it may be that you can make a case for moving things out uh, until you can into a, at least a secured area until you can make things a bit better. Let's see. Mold blooms, trophies, Girl Scouts, uh, We're almost down to the bottom here. Do you recommend lining shelves with fabric or other archival materials such as Volara or Blueboard? Yes. Um, fabric on its own, unless it's stretched over a non-acidic board so that it's basically uh, like a, a painting board, If you just have loose fabric, you run the risk of having it. As you take one thing off, it may move the fabric and pull something else over. So you should hold it there. Volara is very good. You could put fabric over Volara and just fasten it in the back with double-sided tape. Uh, Blueboard, I have not been very familiar with. It, 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 I, somebody else can probably tell you how archival that is. And that's it. So, any more questions? I see that Susan has mentioned that there's been a long discussion in chat about making and using bins. So I would refer you to that. But I would say, don't forget that there is a difference between the kinds of plastic materials that we have learned over decades uh, to use in conservation and in museum storage, as opposed to what's OK to put your sandwich in. Uh, humans are usually a little more resilient than ancient bronzes. So um, you could use something like washed muslin wrapped around Volara. Uh, as a base to put things on. There are a lot, since, since we had all those wonderful grants for in, approving, improving storage, there probably are a lot of photographs running around on the net of how people have upgraded their storage areas. And there are a lot of tips and tricks. Again, the spinach uh, handbook, I think, is, is an awfully good one for sources of supply and for ideas. So, Anything else? No, I think that's it. So um, I just want to thank everyone for attending. And please um, fill out the survey. The link is right here. 
the evaluations are really important and I go over them very carefully and collect the information. And I saw a couple of suggestions for possible webinars and I will follow up on those. So thank you all very much. And I hope I'll be seeing many of you next week um, on May 1st for the uh, presentation on disaster response. That th so thanks. Bye-bye. There you go. That's what you need, guys, disaster response. That's <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Those were really wonderful questions, and I appreciate it. Don't hesitate to get in touch with me if I can help. And thanks for a really interesting session.